Uh, good morning, everyone. I, this is Mike Romano. I'm going to wait a few seconds before everybody from the public can load into the um, viewing area. So that takes a few seconds for Zoom to load. Thanks for joining us. All right, um, that looks like our, our group. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, good morning, well, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to this meeting of the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano, committee chair. Uh, thanks for everyone joining us under current Zoom circumstances. This is our fifth committee meeting of 2021. Um, I'd like to begin with a quick roll call of committee, committee members in alphabetical order. Uh, Judge Espinoza. I'm present. Assembly Member Lee. Uh, Justice Moreno. Uh, yes, here. Uh, Professor Ocean. Here. Ocean, excuse me. Senator Skinner. Here. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a quorum. Uh, today we have two. Oh, and here's Assembly Member Lee, right on time. Assembly Member Lee. Hello. Hi, I was just taking roll call. There we go. Here, I'm Justice. here. Great, we're, we're all here. Um, today's agenda, uh, we have two main pieces of business. Uh, presentation on crime rates uh, and a discussion of the draft report on the death penalty. We'll also have a brief legislative update, uh, hear public comment and take a few five minute breaks along the way. Um, and unless anybody have questions about the agenda, I'm gonna get started with uh, Professor Raphael. All right. Uh, first, we'll hear from Professor Stephen Raphael about crime rates in California and the rest of California, excuse me, in the rest of the country. Uh, Professor Raphael is, uh, teaches at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. He's director of the Institute of Research uh, on Labor and Employment and a faculty affiliate at the California Policy Lab. We're particularly excited to have Professor Raphael here today because it is the first formal presentation by the California Policy Lab to the committee. The Policy Lab has received funding in conjunction with the committee um, from funding from Arnold Ventures to provide research support to the committee. And we're very enthusiastic about the work that we'll all be doing together. Um, I guess with that said, Professor Raphael, if you take it away. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, great, fabulous. I'm gonna just put it in presentation mode to be a little bit bigger. Well, thank you everybody for the opportunity to, uh, to address the commission. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about a, an initial analysis of, of crime trends, in particular what happened between 2019 and 2020 uh, in this country, in California and, in the, and outside of California. And I'll just uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors, Mia Bird, Joanna Laco, and Molly Pickard on, on, this, on this project. So uh, what, what we're gonna do, as of yet, we still don't have complete numbers um, in terms of what's happened uh, to crime in the state and what's happened to crime nationally. But we do have some information that's been published by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on large cities in the country. And we're also able to glean um, data from specific agency departments. So, so basically the way crime data is recorded in this country is it's reported to the police who then report it to the State Department of Justice, then report it to the FBI. And so while we're awaiting the national crime figure, sometimes you can go directly to the, to the source and, and look at things. And so what we're going to see today is a mix of some preliminary numbers that are reported by the FBI for a select set of cities and then some additional evidence for other cities that we gleaned on our own, and then a, a, a somewhat deeper dive into what's happening in Los Angeles so we can at least look at timing. Okay, so uh, Steve, I'll just- Before you get started, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to invite, uh, so this, this report is really terrific and there's gonna be a lot of charts along the way. Some are quite detailed. Um, and I just wanted to invite committee members, if they have questions to, to jump in, I will also leave some time at the end, if it's easier to ask your questions to Professor Raphael at the end. 
but I just want to um, invite others to jump in if that's okay with you, Steve. That's that's perfectly fine. All right, thanks. And I'll try to be clear, but some of them are a little complicated, so um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to make it as painless as possible. <laughs> no, this is really great. We were told there would be no math. That was the only. Yeah, <laughs> there's no math, but there's a lot of a lot of colors. Okay, so so I I thought maybe what I could do is just start with the bottom line in terms of what we're seeing. Um, uh, so. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at data for about 70 cities uh, in the state that covers roughly half the population. And then we're also going to be looking at large cities outside the country that co covers not quite less, considerably less than half of the remainder of the population, but there'll be major large cities. And basically what we're seeing is for the cities for which we have data is that overall violent crime and property crime rates declined in California. Violent crime by, by just a little bit and property crime by a substantial amount. And that sort of parallels uh, um, what we have seen in other localities across the country to a certain degree, although violent crime has increased elsewhere in the nation rather than decreasing like California. However, violent crime rates as officially measured are the sum of a series of individual offenses in particular homicide, aggravated assault, rape, and robbery. So behind an aggregate trend, you can have changes in composition where some crimes can go up and some crimes can go down, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So in California, as in the rest of the nation, there's been an increase in homicide between 2019 and 2020. There's been an increase in aggravated assault, and that's been offset by a decline in robbery and a decline in rape. And the, the net effect of that has been an overall decline in violent crime. While for property crime, there's been a, a, a large decrease in larceny theft that is uh, pretty broad based across California cities. Um, a small decrease in burglary in most places, but not all, but motor vehicle theft has increased uh, um, by a substantial amount uh, over the course of the pandemic. And that all of these trends basically look very similar to what we see uh, in other states. There are some measures, for example, the homicide increase in the California cities is much lower than what we see in other places. And there, there are other measures like the motor vehicle theft rate increase in California that appears to be higher than what are in other places. Um, and then the final bit that, that we'll get into and I'll show you results for is that the timing for many of these changes with the exception of homicide coincides with the stay at home order in mid-March, right? That wh whatever it was about the change in our routines, it's led to declines in things like burglary, larceny and robbery and increases in motor vehicle theft. On the other hand, homicide uh, rates uh, in general seem to increase in the summer of 2020 and they've remained elevated uh, uh, since. And that, that at least that's what we're seeing in California. That appears to be what's going on in other places as well. So now I'll just, I'll show you what, what, what the evidence is. Um, uh, the, the table here is basically showing an average uh, crime rate for the top is violent crime. So there are these four offenses, murder, rape, robbery, and assault uh, uh, summed up. The bottom part of the table is showing property offenses, which is some of burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. And each one of these numbers is a number of incidents per 100,000. So for example, 514, Oh, oops, 514.5 is, that's the number of violent crimes in 2019 per 100,000 California residents. And then we have a column for 2020. First three columns are for California. The next three columns are for other large cities. And so basically what you can see is that violent crime overall declined, right? From 514 to 503.5, but behind that decline are changes in composition. So murder in California, the murder rate in these California cities increased from 4.9 to 6.3. The rape rate declined, the robbery rate declined, and then we saw an increase in aggravated assault. So one thing to point out, since we are only looking at half the state, which are these large states, these baseline crime rates for 2019 are a little bit higher uh, than what we see for the state overall. So for example, the murder rate in 2019 was 4.2 right in these cities, it's 4.9. And that'll turn out to be the true for all of these offenses, right? That for, for what we have data at the moment, crime seems to be a little bit higher. And what we're seeing are, are these changes in, um, in uh, these patterns in violent crime. In terms of the other large cities that we have in the data set, 
there's an overall increase in violent, violent crime outside of California. Um, the murder rate increased by, uh, by 3.1 per 100,000. It's starting from a higher base relative to California and the overall increase in the, in the actual risk of a, of a murder increases by, by an amount that's substantially higher. We also see a decline in rape, a decline in robbery, and there's an increase in aggravated assault outside of, uh, in these cities outside of California that is larger in magnitude. In terms of property theft, Again, what we're noting in California is about a 10% decline between 2019 and 2020, and uh, a similar decline, yet, yet somewhat smaller, both absolutely and in percentage terms for, for other large cities. And behind that is, I don't, can you see those last numbers or are the pictures in the way? Mm -hmm. You're good, okay. Behind that is, uh, is a slight decrease in burglary, a sizable decrease in larceny theft, which is generally fine as theft without contact, right? Um, and then motor vehicle theft is the one offense in California where there's been a big increase. And it's, it appears to be larger than what we're seeing in other states. And we can talk a little bit about what's driving that and, and what, what's the speculation uh, that people have done in the past. Now, one of the things that we also did uh, was just to see what was happening in the largest cities in the country. So the FBI data that, that we were analyzing, unfortunately didn't have uh, data for, for, for some of the biggest cities. So for example, notably New York, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, and San Antonio were absent. So we went to um, their webpage and just, just collected the data ourselves and uh, just did a separate analysis of what's happening in the 10 largest cities in the country, right? Three of which San Diego, LA, and San Jose are in our state. Um, and that's what we're looking at here in this picture, right? So in terms of overall violent crime, it increased the most in Houston, Phoenix, and Dallas. Uh, the, the three California cities that are in among the top 10 experienced either a small increase in violent crime or decreases in violent crime overall. And then in terms of property crime, we see the largest declines in Chicago, San Antonio, the smallest decline in New York, and the California cities are kind of in the middle of the pack. Right, we're not seeing differences that are, uh, we're not seeing any patterns here that are deviating from the rest of the country. If we look at specific offenses, um, so for example, in the upper left-hand corner, and I, I should mention that each one of these lines is the change with a little dot indicating where the change is, right? We're measuring the change along this, this x-axis, and then we're ordering the cities from largest to smallest change. So in terms of the, the increase in the homicide rate, that is receiving so much attention, uh, and, and rightfully so, um, it's a, we're, we're seeing at least for our big cities that is, you know, the largest increases have occurred in Chicago, Philadelphia, Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, and then LA, uh, San Jose, and San Diego are in the bottom, bottom five. Um, the rape rate decline has occurred in all cities. Uh, the California cities, again, are kind of in the middle. The robbery has declined everywhere except San Antonio and Phoenix. Um, uh, again, the California cities are kind of in the middle of the pack. And then assault has also increased pretty much in every single city with the smallest increase in New York City. And our, our three cities are kind of at the bottom in terms of that increase. Um, in terms of property crimes, uh, uh, you know, burglary uh, for the most part has declined everywhere. And again, California doesn't stand out. Um, I can't see the top of my screen, sorry. Is this, uh, oh, this must be, this must larceny. be larceny, right? Larceny. So this, or this was, okay. So this one's larceny. Um, again, California is in the middle. And then motor vehicle theft, we do have, you know, two of our, our big cities are, are kind of at the, at the top of the, at the top of the, um, at the top of the chart. And we'll look a little bit more detail at what's happening to motor vehicle theft, because that's something that we're seeing um, evidence of uh, an important change, okay? So uh, these, this is the one set of graphs that perhaps require a little bit of explanation, but what, what we wanted to do here was to sort of assess, because we've been looking at averages and then also only for the large cities, what's actually um, happening when we look at individual cities in, in the state. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just spend a minute explaining what this is. And, and if, it, if it's not clear, please, please, uh, please let me know. So basically, um, you know, this is a scatter plot, 
right? Where, where along the, the y-axis here, we're measuring the crime rate in 2020. Along the x-axis, we're measuring the crime rate in 2019. And each one of these red dots is, is a California city, right? Where if space permits, uh, we can label which cities they are. And basically what we've done is we've plotted a black line across the diagonal where if you're on that line, if your dots on that line, your 2020 crime rate equals your 2019 crime rate. If you're above that line, crime has increased in 2020. If you're below the line, crime has decreased in 2020. So that's what that means. And then this blue line, the kind of thick blue line is sort of fitting a trend, right? To kind of see, you know, for, for for cities that are in this range of the violent crime rate, what's happening in 2020 9, 20 relative to 19. And if we see the blue line above the black line, it means that crime seems to be higher in those cities. If it's below, it means that crime is, is lower, right? So if we're looking at this top crime rate for violent or this top picture for violent crime, you can see that some cities have increases, some cities have decreased. But for the most part, they're kind of around that line where, you know, last year's crime rate equals this year's crime rate. And we don't, we don't see uh, um, big changes one way or the other. While for property crime, on the other hand... I remember from your written report, this chart represents, for the violent crime, for chart A, a 2% decrease in crime between 19 and 20 overall, in violent crime overall, which is we can't see it on the chart very well because it's just so slight, but two, so 2% two is, uh, is, that's what that re reflects. Is that correct? Yeah, and, or another way to think about it is that for some of the larger cities experience declines, and then when you calculate an average and take into account differences in population, it, it sort of actually the overall crime rate experienced by the residents of these cities has declined. Right, and when you talk about large cities, we're talking, there, there are cities over 100,000, but I couldn't, I hadn't realized there are 70 plus cities in California that fit in that, that category. Well, there's a few more. I think there's 77, but we lose a few because they didn't, they hadn't reported data or the FBI hadn't reported complete data for them yet. Got it. And these cities account for about 19 million people in the state. Right. But they're also a disproportionate amount of crime in California relative to the rural parts of the state. Is that correct? Or, or, or the crime rate in these cities is a little bit higher than it is uh, it, it, from 10 to 20% higher than what we see for the crime rate overall for the right. state. So when right. the total crime rate comes out, which we expect from the Attorney General or the Department of Justice later this summer, because that will include the entire state, we expect that the state overall crime rate will be a little bit lower than these city crime rates. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I, well, I mean, the, the city data won't change, right? So these are, but that, that being said, if we were to tabulate an overall crime rate, so if we went from, say, you know, in the violent, in the, the murder rate went from 4.9, let me just, I just don't want, I don't want to make it up, from 4.9 to 6.3, right, for the state, um, the murder rate in 2019 for the state overall was 4.2, right? So the murder rate for 2020 is unlikely to be 6.3. It'll probably be a lower number. Now, whether it increases by the same amount or, or, or by a lesser amount depends on what happened in the areas that cover the other 20 million people in the population. If they see right. a similar increase, it'll be, if they see less of an increase, it's a, a little hard to speculate. Um, that There are some tabs available from the FBI at the moment that look at their, their sort of preliminary tabulations that, that just look at overall changes in crime rate by city size. And this is for the nation as a whole, and they don't appear to reveal much of a pattern, right? So it's hard to say, uh, it's hard to predict what we'll see when but the- I guess just to clarify, mm -hmm. uh, you expect that when the overall crime rates for California are published later this summer, that they'll be a little bit lower than what you're reporting here because they are, include the more rural areas that generally have a lower crime rate. I don't want you to be a total prognosticator, but if, yeah. if, that's, what you if you, that's what you anticipate. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, so, so uh, back to these, um, these strange looking graphs. So, you know, in the top, right, we can kind of see the trend seems to be last year's crime rate equals this year's crime rate. For property crime, on the other hand, 
Um, that also appears to be true for, for cities that have relatively lower property crime rate. Although for cities that have higher property crime rates, Berkeley, San Francisco, Oakland, Stockton, San Bernardino, we see the trend is towards much lower uh, crime in 2020 relative to 2019. If we look at the individual offenses, right? So these, these four individual offenses, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, sum to the overall violent crime rate, we can kind of see some you know, notable uh, patterns, right? So for the most part, uh, we see you know, larger increases in homicide rates in cities that have higher homicide rates to begin with in 2019. So like Vallejo and Stockton and Richmond and Oakland and San Bernardino stand out. Although we do have a few cities down here, Inglewood, Lancaster, that have relatively low rates, at least in the scatter, and, and we, see some, we see some increases. And then of course, I think this dot right here is Los Angeles. We did have a, an overall increase in our largest city. Um, for, uh, for rape and robbery, we see a very similar pattern, kind of stability for cities with low rates and then declines for cities with higher rates. And then aggravated assault, this is the one that is, is actually differs somewhat from what we're seeing for the rest of the country is it actually looks like, you know, for individual cities that there's stability, but at least for a certain range of, of, high, uh, of, of high assault rate cities, you see some evidence that there's, there's higher rates this year relative to last year. Um, uh, these are the same patterns now for burglary, motor vehicle theft and larceny. Burglary is, is, is uh, generally, you know, there are slight declines and they're concentrated in a few places. Um, motor vehicle theft appears to be up just about everywhere, right? So this is an example where this black line is this year equals last year and the trend is always above it, right? So um, we don't know what is going on, right? So in, in the report, I sort of offered some speculations that, that I've read about in the press and just trying to think through um, kind of, you know, what, what are the circumstances that might lead to more crime, but this is something that we have to study and try to understand. Right. For, for the most part, motor vehicle theft over the long term has been declining because people are, uh, it's a lot harder to hotwire a new car relative to the past. But now, um, apparently, there are reports that, uh, you know, people are, for whatever reason, more likely to leave a running car unattended or, or leave a key fob in their car and walk into their house. And uh, that, that is at least colloquially what we're hearing uh, in the press through anecdotes uh, about what's happening with motor vehicle theft. And then larceny theft, we generally see declines everywhere, right? And most of what's going on there is frankly, you know, we've all been at home a lot in 2020, there's less human activity. And as a result of less human activity, there's, there's less larceny theft. And larceny, just to, to clarify, I believe uh, includes shoplifting and petty theft. And that's, that's those main categories. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so th this is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about, and then we'll uh, and then and then I'll end, and we can take questions if you like, um, so, or you can ask me questions at any time too. So we we wanted to try to look a little bit at the timing of what's happening to to try to see um, uh, you know if we can think how much of this is due to the pandemic, how much of this is due to other things that are occurring, um, and so what what we did is we the the LAPD posts individual data of every crime reported to the police by, by, uh, by the date and actually the time of day. So there's a you know, pretty large data set that, that they maintain and it's publicly available so people can download it. So we did that. And then what, what we did is we, you know, we identified uh, you know, the part one felony offenses that we're talking about, the, the offenses that constitute violent crimes, the, offense, the offenses that constitute um, uh, felony uh, uh, property crimes, and we tabulated the daily total and we're plotting them, right? Where the first red line, okay, is basically March 19th. So that's when we're all staying at home. And the second line, May 25th, is the date that uh, George Floyd was killed and there were large scale protests. So in the research uh, that it, around the country that's starting to burgeon and change in crime, uh, these two dates are things that people are focusing on. The first, obviously, because it changed our schedule. The second, because there uh, are concerns that perhaps there's less cooperation with police or that policing might be changing under, under scrutiny and, uh, and that might be impacting crime rates or there may be 
officers retiring at a higher rate, or there are a whole bunch of stories that are out there that are tying the two. So we're going to be agnostic about what's going on, but what we just want to do is just look and see what's happening around these two dates. And so each one of these dots is a crime total for the date. And then what you're seeing on either side are trend lines that are kind of fit to the patterns. And what we're kind of interested in, is there anything that looks like a break sort of uh, around March 19th? And then just what are the trend lines as we're passing through um, May 25th? And for the most part for, for homicide, what you tend to see is that the initial stay at home order seemed to suppress human activity and there was less homicide. But then as we get into the summer of 2020, there appears to be an increase and that appears to be sustained, right? It's not uncommon that, uh, that murders increase in the summer, right? And uh, many cities sort of, it's, it's a problem that they try to think proactively at addressing, uh, you know, via various, various measures that one, one can take, whether it's violence interruption or summer jobs for kids or what have you, right? And I think what's, what seems to be different this year is it went up and then it didn't, re didn't return. Right, so we just seem to be having higher, uh, higher murder totals, um, as if it was one one long summer. Unfortunately, uh, in terms of the the daily rape totals, you actually see a decline associated with March nineteenth. Um, daily robbery count, there's a, a clear break and trend associated with uh, with the stay at home order, and then also the assault count. You can see what looks like an increase in assault rates. Uh, with, with the same stay at home order. And then there's a few outlier observations on assaults associated with um, uh, May 25th and protests that occurred in Los Angeles. In terms of the property crime, uh, burglary, not much action there, but we see um, some, some outlier observations around the protests. There's a discrete decline in larceny theft with the stay at home order. And we see a discrete increase in motor vehicle theft uh, with, um, with the stay at, stay at home order. Uh, I have no idea why that happened. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll understand that at some point, but it, it's a, it's a pattern that somehow is linked to, uh, to the change in our schedules. Um, and not only are we seeing it in California, we're seeing it around the country. Okay. So that's pretty much all I have. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, entertain or, or try to answer questions to the best of my ability. So thank you very much, Steve. Uh, you know, you and I have been talking about this for a while. I, I do want to take a, a moment to just give a brief shout out to our, um, to an intern that worked for us um, over the spring who, who sort of kicked off some of this research and started raising some of our eyebrows uh, because I think that some of the data here, especially as it pertains to California, mm -hmm. runs counter to some of the national dialogue we've been hearing about crime. So that's how we got all started. And I, before we let Steve go, does anybody have from the committee have a particular question? Yes, Senator Skinner. Um, I'm curious, Obviously, this is our real-time data for 19 and 20. And um, I, you know, I know, again, we can't do anecdotal stuff yet, but I'm wondering if there's correlation yet. Like one of the things around vehicles, um, even the ability to purchase a vehicle was in very short supply, a used vehicle during the um, pandemic. And uh, you know, I read various articles about why that was, but, uh, you know, and whether that added at all to vehicle thefts, I don't know. I don't know if there's any like past time that we can correlate, but around the assaults and the murders, was there, did we see an uptick like that in the recession when we had high unemployment? Um, you know, are there correlations with this kind of economic, uh, you know, um, real severe economic impacts that occur very quickly? I'm just wondering if we can make any, if there's any ability to make any correlations like that. When have we seen similar, similar upticks? Well, yeah. So in terms of the motor vehicle theft, yeah, there are, there are these supply issues that apparently are, are, are currently quite acute, but I think in timing uh, that didn't, that wasn't sort of a March 19th, 2020 issue. It seems to be kind of a, a you know, late spring, summer 2021 issue. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that's what's going on. I, 
my guess would be that it's probably some combination of you know the the you know there's one New York Times article that speculates that it's easy for people to steal a car and leave it somewhere else, mm -hmm. and there's some anecdotal uh, evidence or at least interviews with with um, police chiefs that say, well, we're recovering a lot of the cars, so it appeals that people are just using them instead of an Uber. And I don't know if that's true, but that could be it. But uh, you know, it, another issue is you know, cars are sitting idle and rather than being driven two hours a day, that's two extra hours where they're available to steal. And so it could just be kind of a supply of opportunities thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then the idling, you know, we've all heard anecdotes of someone's car being stolen while they're delivering something, right? And we can see that, uh, you know, that activity is just increased overall. In, in terms of the relationship of, of kind of the economy to crime, there's, well, there's especially work. murders, I guess. What yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, there's research on that question, and and surpri there's surprisingly pretty weak correlation between between murder per se. There, there's more evidence that when the economy is doing doing poorly and people are suffering, there's more larceny theft and and, and things like that. But but murder doesn't appear to be very sensitive for whatever reason. And in fact, there's even some evidence that suggests it might be pro-cyclical and that it might actually you know increase when the economy is pumping and people are out a lot for whatever reason. Um, so it's it's one of those crimes that that is is hard to tell. That there is a there is sort of a, a kind of active debate at the moment um, between researchers about how critical incidents like. Uh, you know, the murder of George Floyd or the killing of Michael Brown or the release of the videotape of Laquan McDonald in Chicago, um, you know, impact homicide, right? And there, there are a few studies out there that have documented that following a critical incident, you can see increases in the, in the months following in, in gun violence. And then I think the interpretation of those patterns is is something that's argued over. There are some people who argue that that it might be due to lack of cooperation with the police and people taking matters into their own hand and settling scores, and others who have argued that the police are changing their behavior in response to the increased scrutiny, uh, and and so on and so forth. So that that is the one. I guess if if I I think about where the crux of of the attention of the research world is now, it seems to be around trying to understand. Um, the relationship between legitimacy, um, critical incidents, and then subsequent uh, changes in, in murder. Huh. Well, the, my other last question is, so I'm assuming this is media impact, but we're, we see that from your data that crime was down in New York City, for example, crime's down here. And yet when I was reading all of the New York Times articles about the New York mayor race, the number one, the, the polls showed the number one thing on those voters' minds was crime. So why is it that they perceived um, that crime was so much higher when the data you show, so it's that it's not? Well, there are some crimes that are higher and, and in particular murder, right? You know, when murder goes up 20%, uh, that, that's that's alarming, right? And and gun violence and aggravated assault, you know. So those those offenses are are real and and they're you know they're very uh, destructive and harmful to people and and the families of the victims. And so even though it's a relatively rare event, the increase in those rare events, some of the more brazen acts of violence that that we're seeing, uh, you know, it's it, it's undeniable that those are those are higher, and that's happened across the country. But I, I think the other kind of you know daily sort of more frequent crime that are that are lower you know it's it's you you can find examples of people shoplifting all the time and if we report it on every single one you know we would think you know that everybody shoplifting all the time in the world is 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 really getting out of control but ultimately we can look at police reports and see well what's happened how you know how is that changing and and uh, and the patterns just it's not uncommon for patterns to deviate from, from public perception. Um, thanks. So uh, Justice Mourinho and then Professor Ochin. Uh, thank you, Professor. A great uh, presentation, notwithstanding all the statistics, but that's, that's great. Uh, the question I had with respect to the murders and then other violent uh, 
crimes, you know, is the link to uh, use of, uh, of guns and gun violence. And we've yeah. seen a lot of things in the news, you know, with respect to the, just the enormity uh, of, of mass killings. I mean, maybe they're being more reported on now than, than before, uh, but we see a constant onslaught of that. In terms of the increase in numbers uh, in both murders and uh, violent crimes, is there any correlation to the use of guns and the prolifer proliferation uh, of guns? And is there any uh, analysis of, uh, of a correlation between the two, uh, a breakdown, so to speak, where a gun is used and, and a homicide and, and a violent crime and, and so forth? Well, in the, in the aggregate data, we can't do that, right? Yeah. Because we yeah. just have total homicide counts. Yeah. But the, the FBI does, does also produce something called the supplemental homicide reports that mm -hmm. gives you incident by incident, victim by victim data on, on the circumstances and the weapon used, how many people were involved. Yeah. Um, it is the case, right, that, that most homicides in the country are single incident events and single, or single victim events. Yeah. But, you know, mass shootings, which I think are defined as three or more victims, I can't remember, can't remember if it's three or four, whatever, it, it, there's a, a threshold. They're more frequent now than they are in the past. Yeah. And it's also the case that, you know, most homicide in this country involves a firearm, right? Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, I, think a, I think it's on the order of 85% or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I have... Uh, several several colleagues um, across the country who are gun experts and one, one of the things that they that you know just an empirical fact that they say is that oftentimes crime in this country is not that different than it is in other countries but it's much more lethal mm -hmm. uh, and that that of course is because we're heavily armed and right. uh, yeah so conflict if it involves a gun it's just more likely to have a higher case fatality rate right okay. thanks uh, Professor Ochin. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this uh, very comprehensive report on uh, something that I think a lot of us have uh, experienced with and our perceptions are shaped by anecdote, mm -hmm. but I think you've given us very clear data on uh, the trends uh, uh, both here in California um, and across the country. Um, my question has to do with um, some of the conclusions that you might draw from the data. Um, you mentioned the Ferguson effect. Uh, so I'm wondering if it would be fair to say uh, that the Ferguson effect in terms of how you're measuring it or how you're able to sort of examine it based on the data that you've uh, described in your report is, is somewhat um, mixed uh, or, or not determinative uh, in other words. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if that's a fair uh, summary of your conclusion. And then the second question that I have has to do with um, uh, something that uh, is sort of lingering, I think, in, in terms of an implication, which is the effect of uh, various criminal justice reforms like Proposition 47, for example, on uh, crime rates. This has been you know, hotly debated. And I, I'm wondering um, what your uh, conclusion would be, uh, I know you don't, you know, come to a, 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 that's not the, that's not the, that is not the focus of your report, but I'm wondering if you have anything that you might speculate or sort of draw conclusions based on your evaluation of, uh, for example, property crime or violent crime, um, and when those initiatives or, uh, when particular pieces of legislation were passed in terms of your timeline and the um, the various charts that you displayed. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, and in, in terms of the Ferguson effect, there's nothing in, you know, we, we weren't really setting out to try to evaluate, you know, uh, one hypothesis versus another. We're just looking at the timing for, for, uh, for California. You know, you see some spikes around, um, you know, the May 25th protest, but you know, I don't think from this you can infer that 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 there's a you know a, a causal effect, and and there are but there are people who are trying to take that question seriously, and there you know there's honest debates about uh, you know why a critical critical incident might lead to an increase in homicide, 
um, you know, that both might be from the policing side or might be from the witness cooperation side or legitimacy side or what have you, right? Um, and and I, I think the jury is still out and there are, there are very smart people working very hard who disagree with one another about that. But, but beyond that, I, I think the other thing we can, we can say is there's so much that has changed you know, between March 2020 and, and the summer, you know, kids that um, were in school were not in school, and then they weren't in school all last year, right? Um, there weren't as many eyes on the street and potential witnesses and people looking out for one another and all of the different ways that, you know, we go about our lives and feel safe because we're in the company of our, our fellow citizens. That changed, and that may have altered things, right? Um, you know, there, there was just a highly stressed situations, right? We were all, all kind of hunkered down, concerned about our health, um, you know, and that could impact aggravated assaults, could impact a lot of things. So it, it's, or, you know, uh, as I was, I was discussing with, uh, with a colleague the other day that somebody brought up, right? You know, in, in my hometown, I live in Oakland, you know, we have a, a pretty robust kind of anti-violence strategy that involves, you know, responding to conflicts that people have and have, you know, community leaders do violence interruption work, things like that. And social distancing must have impacted the ability to do that, right? So we can think of a lot of things that were short-circuited by, uh, by, you know, the last year and a half. And so it's, it's really hard to conclude, right, what is, what is driving murder. But the timing appears to be that it, it started to rise during the summer of 2020, at least in LA, right? Um, in terms of the other, so that there has been a, a fair amount of research on the reforms in California and crime. You know, so in my mind, I think of two big reforms. We had realignment in 2011, and then we had Prop 47 in 2014. The realignment research, some of which I've been a part of and, and some of which others have, have looked at, appears to find very little impact on anything. So there, there's no evidence of an impact on of the realignment reforms of violent crime. And if there's any impact, it appears that uh, there was a small increase in motor vehicle theft rates associated with, um, associated with uh, uh, the change. And then for, for Prop 47, um, again, you, you can't really find any tie between Prop 47 and, and changes in violent crime. If anything, there may be some evidence, mixed evidence and people debate and largely around issues of, of measure and precision of whether there was an impact on larceny theft. Um, but for the most part, the effects seem to be small. And I wonder, I wanna see if I have a, I thought I included, I, I wanted to show you one more figure just to kind of put things in, in a perspective, right? So we actually had a, you know, we went through a, a pretty sizable period of reform in, in, uh, in California. So this is the overall crime rate for the state and it's the overall property crime rate for the state, you know, and realignment happens here, Prop 47 happens here, you know, and then here's property crime. And for the most part, we've had these big declines, right? And there's a big decline also here. And it, it doesn't really seem to have been arrested right, the trends by the reforms we've had. Even what looks to be an, an increase in violent crime rate here, and part of that, that's driven by um, uh, Los Angeles changing uh, their definition of aggregated assaults to include someone being threatened with a firearm, which increased their aggregated assault by 30% and led to kind of an increase in the state aggregate. But for the most part, you know, we, we shrank our correctional populations quite a bit um, over this period, and our crime rates have remained low, right? And our, our homicide rate of, you know, 4.2 per 100,000 in 2019 was lower than the national average, right? And uh, had dropped below the national average in 2014 and has stayed below since. Can I just ask a question about uh, the data that you discussed in certain parts of your report? Uh, you noted that uh, certain large jurisdictions were excluded uh, in terms of the, because they didn't report uh, to the FBI. So for example, Chicago uh, in certain data sets, um, New York in other data sets. And I'm wondering, um, does, what impact does that have on our ability to assess, you know, where California or Los Angeles or Oakland or San Francisco 
uh, or San Diego, Bakersfield, any of these, any of these cities and, and counties are, are situated vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, peer uh, jurisdictions, like, for example, Chicago or mm -hmm. New York or, you know, any, any, any other large city that hasn't reported. Yeah, but so, so what, what we did do is um, that, yeah, I mean, it, it's a definite limitation, right? There are key cities that the FBI didn't include. And so for that reason, we just went to the top 10 and then collected the data directly from their web pages. And we didn't aggregate it into the, the data using the FBI because they have a particular process of quality checking and cleaning and coding and things like that. And I didn't want to um, uh, uh, sort of combined data sets that weren't coming from the same source and been subject to the same process. But what, what we know is that, you know, New York City appears to be kind of roughly speaking similar to what happened on average to the entire, uh, you know, to, the, to our 70 large cities in California with data, at least in terms of the homicide rate. Um, Chicago had a big increase in homicide, right? Um, much larger than, than what we experienced. And so at least for the top 10 cities that we could go collect data on our own, um, the story appears to be the same. Now, I, I think in 2021, when, or in, in the fall of 2021, when we get full FBI data, and most importantly, when we actually have the supplemental homicide reports where we can look at who the victims were, who was arrested for the offense, get some sense of the relationships, we'll be able to say more, right, about, who experienced the biggest increases and maybe learn a little bit about, about what was going on. My understanding, what I've heard from, from others, and in particular um, Richard Rosenfeld, who's, who's been studying homicide trends all year, at least his impression seems to be that, you know, those people who were at an elevated risk of, 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 of being murdered to begin with had an extra elevated risk in 2020. So he doesn't think that there's one particular change, whether it's domestic violence or teenagers or something that is driving the trends, but we don't know, right? So, but, but we, will, we will soon. And just one last uh, question about uh, increase, the increases that uh, you note in your report with regard to um, motor vehicle thefts. Um, one of the things that we've heard, and, and Judge Espinosa, you can uh, correct me if I'm misstating this, uh, at least from the sheriff's department has, has indicated that uh, part of what may and what may be driving uh, the increase in motor vehicle theft is is, is our demand our, our market demands. Um, uh, we talked about some in terms of you know chips and demands for cars and so forth, but um, we've also been told. Um, that in the increased demand for catalytic converters um, um, may also be a contributing factor to um, motor vehicle thefts. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that um, you have engaged uh, or if, if that's something that, that uh, resonates with um, the data that, that you're uncovering. Yeah, I don't, I, well, I mean, I've, I've heard the same thing, especially about the catalytic converters. Um, and, you know, I've had neighbors who have had their catalytic converter stolen four times from the same car. <laughs> so it's definitely happening around uh, the Bay Area and around the country. I think if someone just steals the catalytic converter and leaves the car, I don't think it's motor vehicle theft. Uh, so it, it may, it's either burglary or, or it might be felony. No, I, I guess what I'm saying is if someone is stealing the car for purposes of stripping it for, for parts, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's theoretically plausible. I, I could see that that would be true. I mean, maybe one way that, that, you know, if the, if the commission would want to undertake that would be to see if one could find a, a cooperating agency that would provide more detail on the results of the motor vehicle, that whether the car was recovered and whether it was recovered missing the catalytic converter or was just recovered in a different part of town, you know, unharmed or, or not stripped or what have you. But I think that's something we could we could potentially uh, know more about. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to mute my camera for just a, maybe about 20 minutes. So uh, apologies. Thank you. Follow up, uh, Steve. Um, on the, I think Professor Ochin raised a point that you and I have spoken about. I just want to clarify the FBI data that you're able to pull in aggregate did not include Chicago, New York, those cities. However. You were able to go directly to the source 
and get the data from those cities. So they were included. They're not completely excluded from the report. And furthermore, um, the FBI does a projection of statewide data, which is also sort of double checking what's going on in your report. I just want to make sure that we're not completely excluded, which I think Professor Ocean is correct. Chicago, New York, other big cities. They're, that's that's. Yeah. yeah, that's that's right. And and the the FBI actually has released uh, nationwide estimates of the changes in UC, as well as kind of broad for broad census regions, and the patterns look pretty similar, right? At, you know, homicide I think is arguably what what many are concerned about, and and for good reason. And it appears to be nationwide about a 25% increase in southwestern states. I think it was 26% northeastern. It was 30% something like that. So it, whatever it happened, it seemed to be pretty broad based across the country. All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions? All right. I, let, let me just say a big thank you, uh, Professor Raphael. Uh, I, I, you know, got interested in this for some of the reasons that Senator Skinner raised earlier. We just seen crime and the apparent crime wave in the headlines, particularly in California. I mean, the New York Times has run two or three stories in the past couple of weeks about surging crime in California. Um, and I mean, even today, I think President Biden is talking about uh, a crime wave sweeping the country. Um, unfortunately, what the, the, the data and those stories rarely seem to include uh, the hard data, which is why we asked Professor Raphael to really take a look at it. And if you take a look at it and deeper dive, which we've seen today, it doesn't, this crime, this, this crime wave doesn't seem to really apply uh, to California at least, when we're, especially when we're talking about uh, overall uh, violent crime and overall uh, property crimes, which seems to have fallen in California. And in fact, even when you count for homicides, which have gone up in California, as they have elsewhere, our state seems to be outperforming the rest of the country in almost every category uh, tracked by the FBI, uh, which I think is, is, is quite encouraging, uh, especially as we continue to pursue, pursue uh, criminal justice reform. So um, that's you know, why we you know, sort of became interested in this data. And again, you know, it's our, our first real um, um, project with CPL and Steve, and we're going to have you back. You're, <laughs> you're, you're a hit. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I, I really appreciate it. Of course, his report is um, available to all members and on the, and the public uh, for um, more detail on, on all of this. Uh, so, so, so thank you, Steve. Um, and we're going to move on to our next uh, thank you, agenda Robert. item. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Tom for an administrative and legislative update. Yes, hi, everybody. This will be uh, super quick. Um, just, just a few things just to bring everyone up to speed. First, we uh, still have an open slot on the committee um, that Governor Newsom will make an appointment for. So that is still uh, something that uh, needs to happen. Just wanted to update everyone on that. The second thing is it looks like we're also going to be able to hire two more attorneys in the near future and I uh, just wanted to let the committee members know about that so if you know of anyone and of course anyone in the audience uh, please be in touch with me or anyone on staff and, and check the website if you're interested in, in those opportunities it's uh, it's good work as you can see today um, finally uh, we should handle approving the uh, minutes from the May meeting if you think this is a good time to do that Mike we could sort of cross it off the list you might be muted. Uh, I move to I'll, I'll move approval of the minutes. Second. Second. Great. And then. All right, they're approved. And then finally, just a very brief uh, status. Hold on, before we move on, just says uh, Noza. All right, continue, Tom. OK. And then very uh, a quick status of where we are with a few of the uh, committee's proposals in the legislature. So. Um, we have seven bills that are pending covering six of the recommendations. You can see them here. These uh, seven have all passed the first house or in, in the second. This includes uh, SB 81, which is one of Senator Skinner's bill was on uh, the section 1385 guidance about uh, how sentence enhancement should be applied. And there are two other bills that um, are not active right now. And you can see those at the bottom. So, you know, obviously this is still a, a moving target, but um, this is where things are right now. And if anyone has any 
questions about any of those in particular, happy to answer them. But if not, that's all I've got. Well, I just want to say, first of all, uh, I'm really proud that seven bills that you know come out of our report are you know at least made their way through the first house. I think we should, in our inaugural year, should be pretty proud about that. We took off. We were quite ambitious, perhaps more ambitious than we should have been. Um, and it's a testament, I think, first of all, to the work of the committee, but especially to staff who have been nursing these bills, working with committee staff, and uh, really um, has been. We've had quite a bit of help. So uh, I'm really uh, glad, and, and I think we shall be uh, proud. Hopefully, they will get uh, passed and, and signed by the governor. Um, before we, I, I want to. Our next item of business is the is the death penalty report and public comment. Before we get there, uh, I'd like to take a break. Before the break, does anybody have any questions? All right, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. After we get back from the break, the committee members will discuss and have any, if you have any questions, comments, edits, suggestions about the draft report, then we will have public comment about the draft report and then we will vote on whether or not to adapt the report with or without any edits uh, or comments. Uh, that's the sequence that we're gonna need to uh, proceed with. So with that said, we're gonna take a, a 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 2.10. So see you all in 10 minutes, thanks.
All right, we'll reconvene here in um, a minute or two. Thanks. All right, if uh, committee members could come back and turn on your cameras, um, love to get started. I'm gonna also ask uh, committee staff to turn on their cameras because they were the primary drafters of this report. So um, they might be answering questions. Michael, this is Pete. Uh, I'm gonna keep my camera off for just a minute while I finish lunch. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Professor Ochin, are you with us? I got a text from Senator Skinner that she is in a budget committee. Uh, yes, I'm here. Great, terrific. Um, and Judge Espinoza, we know that you're there having lunch, but please chime in because we really do want your help. Um, so now we're moving on to discussion about the, the draft report uh, on the death penalty. So um, obviously we've voted as a, as, a, as a committee to recommend the abolition of the death penalty in California. And like last time, with our proposals, we are going to have a written report that accompanies that. Um, unlike last time, we're going to have a um, standalone report on the death penalty and we're not gonna combine it with any other recommendations or reforms that we might have. Um, like our last report, this report will be professionally copy edited and graphic designed. So this is not the final, final version. Um, if you have copy edits, this is not really the time for that please uh, see Tom or email those to Tom. The point of today is to see if there are substantive changes uh, that the committee wants uh, with the understanding that I will have a final discretion over adding citations, further quotes, updating data and non-substantive um, changes to the, to the report. Um, so with that introduction, does anyone have, um, Questions, comments, suggestions, or concerns about report, um, or any specific sections that you'd like to discuss as a group? Yes, Justice Moreno. I, I not a particular comment, but I just, you know, want to uh, applaud uh, the staff members uh, who prepared probably one of the most comprehensive reports on the status of the death penalty, if not in California's. Uh, certainly in California, if not in, in, in the country. Uh, I was very impressed with the cataloging of the history in California and how it's uh, through case law, uh, propositions and legislation, how uh, and views on the death penalty have really evolved over the years. And I think at the present time, uh, I hate to use the term, but inflection point <laughs> that we hear so often uh, and I, I was very impressed with the quality of the of the report. And I was familiar with the the report uh, that was done by a state commission back. Was it 2008, 2009? I think I was on the Supreme Court when that came out. Uh, but this report, I think, really not only builds on that, uh, but uh, really sets us in a direction. I think that. You know, we will assume, at least as a state, uh, join the majority of industrialized countries in the world by making the recommendations that we do. And in particular, I just want to point out that the number of recommendations and the rationale for the conclusion, I think, are really uh, well thought out, whether it's in the number of, uh, you know, death eligible uh, allegations. Uh, 
the societal implications of, that have led to where we are uh, now, to the uh, report on the number of uh, reversals uh, and uh, factually innocent findings and so forth. I think it's, it's just really a very comprehensive report. So I, I would urge that people review it. And then one comment I'd make as an aside, I know this is appropriate now, but uh, I would like, and I think our commission should authorize the printing of some hard copies of the report. Uh, I think that would really, really help in its distribution. That's all I had. We can certainly do that. I'd also like to echo uh, what, said, uh, what Justice Marino said. Um, I've been working with the committee, you know, uh, on, on looking at some of these drafts, but uh, staff have worked overtime um, uh, on this report and really knocked themselves out. So, uh, you know, really go into the to the the, the extra mile and every corner to, to try to make the support um, really a, a contribution to the uh, discussion and literature and research on the death penalty of which there's been so much and right. such a high bar. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm really proud that I think that we've met that high bar and um, it, was, it, was, it was a real team effort. Um, aside from Tom and Rick and Laura, I just also wanna, uh, um, acknowledge we had uh, consulting help from Natasha Minsker, who's obviously a death penalty expert. And so uh, we got a lot of help on this and it was a real team effort. And, uh, and I am also impressed and proud, by, proud of it. Um, but uh, I don't wanna make this quite a coronation. Do well, other folks have uh, uh, any, any substantive comments uh, before we hear public comment and then vote on this? All right, um, I, I will say, so good, great. Uh, I will say that first, first of all, obviously we can do the, the, the hard copies and we will get those distributed. We'll also obviously distribute it online. Um, I will work with committee on non-substantive changes, um, especially the, we'll add charts, uh, professionally copy edited, there you know, might be um, some organizational stuff, but we'll, and we'll get it out uh, as, as quickly as uh, possible. If other committee members have non-substantive changes along the lines I mentioned that you'd like to um, give input to, please uh, contact me uh, and we'll make that happen. Okay, yeah. with that said. Now, you know, one final yeah. thing I would say is that, you know, a lot of times these reports are 100, 200 pages long. And I know when I delved into this, I think it's something like 40 pages and maybe a little longer once we do the graphics and things, but it, it's really readable uh, and very, very focused on the uh, particular deficiencies uh, with where we stand uh, with, the with the death penalty uh, over time. So in that sense, it really, I think, you know, really clarifies and organizes uh, the reader uh, in being able to understand all the all the nuances and so forth in uh, you know with respect to to the death penalty, so it's 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 hard to say that a, a report is really readable, but I think this one is. <laughs> I'll also say that that was a big part of the work that the committee put yeah. into it. Um, but that doesn't come easily, obviously, yeah. and so you know. Uh, again, big thank you to you, to you guys. Um, all right, with that said, we wanna make sure that we hear from the public before we vote on this. Um, so we've come to the point of public comment. Uh, to get in line for public comment, uh, please select not, well, I'll tell you when, not yet, the raise hand function in Zoom. If you're calling on the phone, uh, please hit uh, star nine. Uh, everybody should please note that this meeting is being recorded and that if you make a public comment, your name and or phone number may, may be displayed as part of the recording. Um, so 
If you would like to comment, the time has come. Please select raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. We'll take a minute to see how many people want to comment. And based on that, I'll see how long each comment period will take. I will take a few minutes to uh, make sure uh, everybody can get in line. And then um, we, will, we will hear from you folks. So um, thanks. Please raise your hand now. We've got a number of folks, Mike, we can get started and people could keep, you know, lining up. I wanted to make sure before I sort of judged how long we're going right. to go for. So, um, All right, I count about 12 people, is that right, Tom? Yeah, 12, 14, something like that. All right, so uh, here, here's how I'd like to do this. Um, as always, really the best way to get in substantive comments to uh, the committee is to submit them in writing. And the that goes directly to Tom and then to me. Um, so please feel free to send in uh, emails or whatever to explain um, any point that you may have in more detail. In the public comment period, because we have so many people who want to talk, um, we have to keep those uh, 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 short. And I'm going to ask people to keep to limit their uh, comments to 90 seconds. Um, and then, like I said, if you have further uh, points that you'd like to make, to please make them by email. And our email address is, is online. Uh, with that said, I'm going to start with the top of the list and uh, ask uh, J.H. To, to, to kick us off. Hi, my name is Jeff Hickey. And I'd like, Hi, Jeff. I, I'd like, uh, I'm from San Leandro, and I'd like to say I appreciate and support your recommendations on the death penalty, and I understand that you really want to keep it narrowly focused, but I wish you would continue to look at and consider including life without parole. It's really death by incarceration. Everybody, the NASA says it's 4.1% of the people on death row don't belong there for the crimes they've been convicted of. Uh, I think Gavin Newsom said approximately 2%. It has to be the same amount or higher who are in prison forever without hope, without redress with those life without parole. And usually they're people of color or very often a higher percentage is people of color. It discriminates against the poor and those who can't afford an attorney. And I wish you could look at that. And I know that you have to do what you have to do, but I wanted to get this in. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, thank you very much. I will just have just note real quick that we have uh, had a hearing on life without parole and that will be addressed in a separate report uh, from the committee. So we are very well aware of life without parole. We were handling the death penalty separately uh, for, for a number of reasons, but we, we do appreciate your comment. Uh, Bethany Webb. Hi, um, so my name is Bethany Webb. Um, my sister Laura was murdered in a mass shooting um, in Seal Beach, California. Um, it's the largest mass shooting in Orange County history. Uh, eight people died total. Besides my sister, four of my friends, one person survived, it was my mom. Um, it was in an open and shut case. Um, there was multiple, my mom was the only survivor, but multiple people saw him, he confessed and it turned into the informant scandal. We're not in, in, in aware of that. I spent six years in court and watched the police at the Orange County Sheriff's Department and the Orange County District Attorney um, lie and perjure themselves. Um, that's just not my opinion. That went through multiple publications. You can read about that. And what I saw 
I will be honest, I was not a proponent of the death penalty to, be, to begin with. I understood the disparity of which it was um, given to people. But what I saw for the six years in court made me absolutely sure that um, we cannot trust any system right now to take the lives of our citizens, nor should we. Um, you're not gonna heal me. You're not gonna bring back Laura by killing other people. And I'd like to end with that. My sister, the man that killed my sister said, he went in there to shoot his wife and, and she, my sister worked with her, Michelle. And he said, well, why did you kill everybody else? And he called them collateral damage. If we know that there are innocent people on death row, which we do, then we're okay with collateral damage. And I'm calling you as the sister of collateral damage to tell you that that is not okay. I'm on the executive board of Death Penalty Focus as well. Um, thank you so much for this work. It's really important and, and it's not done on the back of victims' families. You're not gonna heal us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webb. And of course, we send your, our condolences and thoughts to you and your family uh, about your sister. And thank you for speaking up um, even in the face of such incredible tragedy. Thank you. Um, William Richards. Mr. Richards. Yes. Yes. I spent 23 years in prison for a crime I did not commit. It was a murder. I've recently been ruled factually innocent. So I have an insight to a lot of these things. How easy it is to be convicted when you're not guilty and how hard it is to get out of prison. To that effect, since I've been out, I've probably met 40 exonerees like myself who got off the death row. And I feel if there's that many people that have been proven innocent after being sentenced to death, the numbers of people on death row are probably astronomical that don't belong there. So my view is it's too final, it's too barbaric, and it should be eliminated. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Richards, for, for your point. And um, congratulations, I guess. And, and I don't know if to apologize, but congratulations on winning your freedom. So thank you for your comment. Uh, Steve uh, Rode, did I pronounce your name correctly? Stephen Rode. Rode. No problem. Thank you very much. I uh, fully support the uh, report and its recommendations. I hope the report will emphasize that your recommendation is to repeal, not reform, uh, the death penalty. It was 27 years ago when Justice Harry Blackman said, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. And it's been 49 years since the Furman case struck down the death penalty. And it's been 13 years uh, as Justice Moreno mentioned that the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice uh, recommended the end to the death penalty. Uh, this is a failed experiment at the cost of the lives of uh, people. And uh, one justice said it is cruel and unusual like lightning is cruel and unusual. Uh, it has no place in our society. Uh, for all of the very well outlined reasons in the report. I also hope the report will clarify that your recommendation is retroactive, that the elimination of the death penalty, which is a systemically flawed system, must be systemically applied to everyone uh, on death row. I appreciate the interim recommendations unless and until the death penalty is uh, eliminated. And until that time, uh, I hope uh, the uh, powers that be accept your uh, recommendation. I am chair of Interfaith Communities, United for Justice and Peace, an interfaith group. I am on the Black Jewish Justice Alliance uh, and I am on the board of Death Penalty Focus and I'm very grateful for the time you gave us. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rohde. I'll just take a quick, very quick moment, if I may, to, to say, um, if I, I may be wrong about this, but I think I'm correct that uh, Michelle Alexander was Justice Blackman's clerk 
at the time that he wrote that very famous line that you cited. And of course, she went on to write The New Jim Crow, which was such an important, I think, milestone, really, in American criminal justice in terms of opening so many people's minds and eyes to racism throughout the entire system. And so I see a direct line between that very line um, and, and the work that we're doing today. Uh, so, so thank you uh, so very much. Um, Donna. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Donna Doolin Larson, and I want to thank all of you for your great work and all the efforts that you put into this penal code regarding the death penalty to, I hope to say, abolish it. I'd like to hear that word. I have a factually innocent son on death row, Keith Doolin. He's been there for 27 years. As noted in your report, recognizing the lack of investigation and qualified attorneys for the death penalty appeals makes it insane when you have DNA and other exculpatory post-conviction evidence to prove one's innocence. I also reviewed in the report how there are common threads and technical processes in the death penalty cases, which I label as ineffectiveness of trial counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, judicial misconduct, evidence tampering, and the list could go on. As I gleaned from this report, Prop 66 has made the life of the entire death penalty scheme unbearable and does not accomplish what the pinned authors wanted the people of California to believe. Please do not kill in my name, as the people of California are the ones setting forth the execution order. End the death penalty and drop LWAP, and thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. I really appreciate your comments. Um, the next on our list is Daisy. Hello, Daisy, I think you're muted. Um, Daisy, I think you're muted. All right, Daisy, um, I think you're having some technical difficulties or we're having technical, we can't hear you. So uh, I'm gonna move on to Joseph and uh, we'll come back to you, Daisy, if we can figure that out. So Joseph. Um, hello, uh, uh, members of the commission and uh, Chair Romano. I uh, certainly follow with uh, Judge Moreno's remarks about the amazing report that the staff presented. I, I'd like all Californians to, or any who are interested in criminal justice at all to, to read it. And also my compliments to the commission on having a stepped proposal to the uh, legislature because people may not want to go with uh, all the way with your um, your major and very clear recommendation. Um, I have uh, a couple of points uh, that uh, may be useful to you or the legislators among you in uh, arguing with your colleagues about this. Uh, one is the way that the death penalty is used at, with some of the component enhancements and other features being bargained away in uh, plea bargaining shows that the people administering the system uh, don't really believe that those chips that they're bar bargaining away to get a guilty plea to a, a non-capital uh, charge uh, really uh, mean much for the public protection. Otherwise, they wouldn't be uh, engaging in that bargaining. So there's a weakness even within the people who, are, um, who will probably show up uh, in favor of retaining the penalty. Um, another thing is here, with no demonstrated public safety advantage to having the penalty, having it there adds a factor of desperation, more desperation to the uh, search for, arrest and encounter and, uh, and arrest of people who are going to be charged with offenses that could be capital, in danger for the police, in danger for the account, the, their encounter uh, and for everyone. Um, somebody a couple of miles away was killed, a manager of a store. Uh, there was a police chase, somebody was being sought for, uh, for killing. Um, Joseph, yes, I'm going to I'm just going to interrupt you here. Uh, we really do appreciate your comments, right. but we, we want to try to get through every everyone's. Of I course, appreciate I've you. written these. I've written them and sent them in to, uh, to you also. That's perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, Daisy, have you have we have we do we have you now? 
Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Thank you. Th thank you so much. And I do appreciate all the work that, that your committee is doing. I support the committee's recommendation to abolish the death penalty and reduce the size of death row because 185 people have been exonerated from death row across the country based on evidence of their innocence. In 2018, Venice Benavides was exonerated after spending 25 years on California death row for a rape and murder he did not commit. The Academy of Sciences estimates that more than 4% of US prisoners on death row are innocent. With 703 condemned people on California death row, dozens are very likely innocent. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you so much, Davey, we, Daisy. We really appreciate uh, your comments. Um, I'm gonna ask how to pronounce the next name. Uh, Gavrila, is that how you pronounce your name? It is, and, and again, you can call me G, I think. Oh, that's... right, hello, how are you? <laughs> call me G, or G. Lala. Uh, hey, thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here again. I'm the coordinator for the San Francisco Amnesty International chapter. Um, and I really have huge gratitude for your excellent report. And I am particularly grateful that you included two very dear friends of mine in your report, Kevin Cooper and Jarvis J. Masters. Uh, they both have extremely compelling cases of innocence. And I do wonder if maybe you might want to include a few others. Um, my colleague, Donna Larson's son, Keith Zondulin, has a compelling case of innocence, and there are others. Of course, I am against the death penalty, regardless of innocence or guilt, but there are so many compelling cases of innocence that make it especially um, egregious and, and horrific. Um, I also just want to say, because it's been my mantra, uh, I hope that everyone listening on this call is actively working to fight against the recall of Governor Newsom, who so bravely imposed the moratorium, and now he is having tremendous grief because of this brave act. And um, as we see from the recall petition, the moratorium and its criminal justice stance is one of the reasons for the recall. Um, and also to repeat myself and echo what others are saying um, over the last few months. And I know that there's a separate, you know, I attended this, the, the part on LWAP and I know that we'll be considering it in the future, but we really do need to abolish both. Um, if we are going to commute sentences, for, oh, can I, can I just- Yeah, finish, finish up, G. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, LWAP is just not a desired next step for anybody I know on, on death row. And I really, really, really hope we can really work toward um, maybe working toward emulating a Scandinavian carceral, carceral model or, or, you know, kind of really rethink this, this um, puzzle. I think California can do it if anyone can. We're trying. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, G. Uh, the next person is a telephone number whose last five last four digits are uh, five two zero two. Hi, hello. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Leslie Vasquez, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of California, and I'm here today to support the committee's recommendation that California repeal the death penalty. And I applauded support of the specific steps and legislation in furtherance of this recommendation. Um, so today in California has the most people on death row in the country at 705, which is twice as many as the state with the second highest number of people on death row. California's criminal legal system and its way of, that is punishing is plagued with racial bi bias, geographic disparities, and high cost. The death penalty is not only cruel and inconsistent with the values of a moral society, but it also fails to protect public safety and help crime survivors heal. The League of Women Voters of California agrees that eliminating the death penalty is a crucial step towards creating a just system for all in California. We thank the committee for recommending the repeal of the death penalty and supporting bills and other steps that help us move towards that goal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your comments. Um, Ms. Fernandez. Hi, this is Maria Jose Fernandez with the California Catholic Conference. And um, as the official public policy office for 
the bishops and the whole Catholic Church in California. We just want to thank the committee for the recommendations. We are in full support um, in abolishing the death penalty and reducing the size of death row. Uh, we believe in upholding the sacred dignity of every person and that the death penalty is an attack on the inviolability and the dignity of that person. And we believe that a just and necessary punishment shouldn't exclude the dimension of hope and the goal of rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And obviously the Catholic Church has played a leading role in this. And, and I think that that's uh, quite remarkable. So, so thank you for your, for your work. Um, Ms. Navarrete. And, hi. Hi. This is your, hi, this is Yolanda Navarrete and I'm with the Drop LWAP Coalition, Fuel Felony Murder Elimination Project and Initiate Justice. I uh, fully support everything that you guys are doing and I, most importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you for your honorable time that you've dedicated to abolish the death penalty and abolish life without the possibility of parole. You know, people are there because of insufficient counsel and prosecutorial misconduct by overcharging people of color. And it is finally, finally a breath of fresh air to hear that we're going to make something right that has been so wrong over the years. My husband has served 27 years on an LWAP sentence while his three white counter co-defendants didn't get half of those charges. So I, it's just a breath of fresh air and I fully support everything you guys are doing and thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being a regular uh, caller and supporter for, for what we do. we do, we do appreciate it. Uh, Leland Campbell. Yes, hi, I am Leland Campbell. I am Associate Director of Restorative Justice for the Diocese of San Jose, and I work in detention ministry. I uh, have a lot of experience with different uh, men that are incarcerated, and I am full in full support of what uh, everybody else has been talking about as well. I've been involved in this the last couple of years with different agencies, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, great news that uh, uh, this report is uh, going to be established uh, and moving forward. So thank you very much. Well, well, thank you for your support and your, your work in this, in this effort. Um, Richard Hirsch. Yes, thank you. Um, I am retired after 52 some years in the criminal justice system, both as a prosecutor and defense attorney, and I commend the committee for its proposed recommendation. Just want to bring to the committee's attention a book that was written by a friend of mine, Jed Rakoff, who's a United States District Judge in the Southern District of New York, entitled Why the Innocent Plead Guilty and the Guilty Go Free. And he has a whole chapter on the death penalty, and, and including the fact that his brother was murdered, and he became a, an advocate for abolishing the death penalty because of seeing so many people in his practice and on the bench who were innocent were convicted. Uh, I personally represented a young man who was 17 years old when he was convicted and sentenced to prison for a murder he didn't commit. He spent 26 years of his life there and was found by a district court to be innocent uh, based on perjured testimony. So these are all the, in, the things that go on in the system, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But uh, Judge Rakoff's book, I think would be something would be of interest to the committee or at least its staff. So I thank you for the time and uh, nice to see you again, Judge Espinosa. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Uh, next up is Mike Farrell. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good, thank you. Things confound me. Uh, <laughs> I have been uh, an abolitionist and uh, talking about debating and arguing and discussing the death penalty for 40 years. I just want to thank you so much for the extraordinarily comprehensive work your committee has done, your staff has done, and uh, the package you have presented is, is a very impressive, and I hope will be uh, terrifically uh, uh, um, moving to the people in, in, involved in this question. Uh, I'm the president of Death Penalty Focus, and uh, we have been involved in initiatives over the years um, we know that it's a very difficult political question for some. Um, I would urge you to support, if need be, a, uh, a, a, an initiative 
out of the legislature to uh, need to deal with the question. Um, having spoken to the issue of the, the problems with the death penalty that you have so eloquently articulated here, uh, the racism and the cost and the fact that it entraps and kills the innocent, um, the thing that bothers me that people don't want to hold on to is the fact that Jeremy Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a doctor who um, was an anti, anti-slavery and who formed the Pennsylvania Prison Project, opposed the death penalty because he said it brutalizes everyone associated with it. It is my concern that the practice of the death penalty in this country is brutalizing all of us. And I think we see elements of that brutalization broadcast today in ways that are uh, extraordinarily uh, confounding to people, but very moving. I think it's a matter of the public health that we do away with this awful practice. And I, I, I thank you. I, I just like to quote Jeremy Rush, who was talking about the fact that we moved from a monarchy where the divine right of kings to take a life was replaced by a republic. And he said, an, ex an execution in a republic is like a human sacrifice in a religion. Uh, we are making a huge mistake and a damaging mistake to continue this process. And I thank you for your work and your efforts. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Farrell. And I, I just wanna make a special comment. I, I followed your career for a very long time, um, obviously as president of Death Penalty Focus, but I, I think it's especially commendable that you've taken your celebrity, honestly, um, and dedicated to this cause for so uh, many years. And uh, as somebody who grew up watching you on TV, um, it's I, I really appreciate it, and I and I and I wish that others um, would would use you know their powers and dedicate them. And, and it's really quite honorable, and I, I'm very uh, impressed with what you've done and have been so committed over the years to this. So so thanks. You're very uh, kind. Thank you very much. And I'm welcome. working on some of the others. All right, terrific. Uh, AJ Joven. Hi, um, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, my name is AJ Hoven and I'm the Director of Advocacy for the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Bernardino. And we are here to voice uh, support for the recommendations uh, regarding the death penalty. As a people of faith, the, the death penalty stands in opposition to our values of mercy, redemption, and given the disparities in its application and its history of wrongful convictions uh, in opposition to justice as well. We thank you for the opportunity to speak and we thank you for your recommendations. Well, thank you Mr. very much, Mr. Hoven. And like I said before, the, the faith community, particularly the Catholic community has been so strong on this. Uh, it's really admirable and, and, and I appreciate it. All right, uh, the next person to speak, I'm gonna probably mispronounce your name as well, but it's uh, Yoko Otani Aspurian, Sperlin? Yes. Hello, yes. can you correct can me I... on how to pronounce your name? Yes, Otani Sperling. Sperling, all right. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the recommendation to abolish the death penalty. As someone else mentioned, 185 people who were once sentenced to death have been exonerated across the country. In fact, in California, one person was exonerated in 2018 after spending long 25 years. And when it comes to death, one mistake too many. We cannot kill people by mistake or by the government. It's time to end this cruel punishment altogether. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the support and, and I think by and large, we agree with you. Uh, John uh, Storm. Good afternoon. I am John Storm. I'm the Director of Restorative Justice for the Diocese of Santa Rosa, California. I was formerly a probation officer for several county courts and for the federal probation office in San Francisco. 
Wow. I'm calling in support of the abolition of the death penalty. My experience informs me that the current system of criminal justice is imperfect and that some people are wrongfully con convicted. The wrongful execution of even one uh, innocent person is too great a cost to pay for our society. Even when the death penalty is imposed on a guilty person, the death penalty itself is the infliction of violence in retribution for a specific act of violence and does not enhance public safety in any way. A continuation of the death penalty is an affront to the human dignity, not only of the person executed, but of our entire society and reduces and diminishes uh, the human dignity of the people of California. Uh, I oppose the continuation of the death penalty and support your efforts for its abolition. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Storm. Uh, we appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, Greg, I may mispronounce your last name, uh, Walgenbach. You got it, thank you. I'd like to thank the whole committee. Uh, my name is Greg Walgenbach. I direct the Office of Life, Justice and Peace for the diocese, Roman Catholic Diocese of Orange in Orange County and want to lend my voice as well, our voice as a, as a church to uh, the recommendations made here and in favor of this move towards um, abolishing the death penalty. So I'd like to thank you all for the work and, uh, and, and lend our voice as well. Thank you. Oh, well, well th thank you uh, very much. We appreciate the support. And last but not least, um, Marciano Avila. I think you're muted. Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yes. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, yes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. My name is Marciano Avila. I am the director for the Office of Restorative Justice for the Diocese of San Bernardino. And I am calling in to, to voice support for the recommendation to abolish the death penalty. You know, some years ago, there was a movement to abolish the death penalty that had t-shirts that said, why do we kill people who kill people to show that killing people is wrong? The death penalty is wrong. It is morally wrong. Uh, the fact that so many people have been uh, exonerated shows that many, many are on death row who don't belong there. Uh, the system is flawed, it's broken, and uh, the only way right now that I see people or that I see a way to fix it is to abolish it. Um, so thank you for, uh, for your efforts. Thank you for all your work on this, and, uh, and God bless. Thank you uh, very much. We really appreciate your comments, as, long, as well as everybody else um, who showed up. Uh, I hope you appreciate that we take this uh, quite seriously and we really do appreciate everybody weighing in. Um, and it has influenced our, our work, uh, uh, without, without question. Um, all right, so uh, now I'd like to move to our final item of business today, which is to vote, uh, to formally vote on the uh, report. Uh, the issue on the table is whether or not to adopt uh, the draft report as written. Um, and subject to our discussion earlier, including the prerogative I have as chair to make non-substantive changes, approve design, um, and execute its publication. Um, so uh, I make such a, uh, I move to adopt the report. Can I have a second? Second. Second, second thanks. Are, uh, any opposed? All right, uh, terrific. I am very proud that uh, we've adopted again unanimously uh, this report that was uh, crafted so so with so much care and effort by especially by committee staff. So so thank you all. Um, it will take some time, as with last time, uh, to get it professionally edited, uh, designed, uh, get the charts done. Uh, but we'll obviously keep you posted as that process, as the production process uh, goes through. So uh, thank you all. Uh, finally, our next meeting is in three weeks on uh, July 13th and 14th. At that meeting, we'll cover sentencing practices in general, including reforms that reduce incarceration while improving public safety, our history of uh, indeterminate sentencing and we, how we got the determinate sentencing scheme uh, that we have today. Members of the public who want to stay up to date with the committee can join our mailing list on the committee website. Uh, and I really appreciate you all. Uh, thank you and have a good week. I'm always available uh, if need be by email or cell and, and have a good rest of your week. Thanks everybody. Uh, this concludes our, uh, our, our meeting for today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.